We join Dr. Mike Hartshorn in Albuquerque, who describes the 2926 restoration project. The New Mexico Steam Locomotive and Railroad Historical Society was formed in the late 90s. There were a few people who had actually been associated with this machine when they were young men and thought it would be just dandy to have an operating steam locomotive, the 2926, uh, based in Albuquerque. And after all, uh, everybody knew that it was in excellent shape, that the Santa Fe Railroad took good care of its equipment. It wouldn't take much, uh, a little lubrication, perhaps some paint, a few gauges, and it'd be ready to run. So they bothered the city government to gain uh, title to this machine. The thing that did the trick was they reminded the mayor and the parks and recreation uh, people that it was dribbling asbestos over a city park where kids play. So Mayor Baca signed the bill of sale for one dollar and said, fine, now get it out of my park. And that cost $165,000 to lay temporary track and have it pulled down to where it could be uh, added to a spur that was connected to the main line here in Albuquerque. And there we sat for a couple of years, couldn't do anything. Um, the spur where it is being restored was found uh, by a couple of our guys in uh, about 2001, and by 2002 we got permission to use it. It actually belongs to the federal government, but they hadn't used it since the 50s. And so we have a license to occupy the area, and in uh, 2002, uh, the Santa Fe old timers working for BNSF uh, arranged to have us pushed in here uh, with some locomotives that were still labeled AT and SF, made a better picture. And when we got to the site, we had a sheet of concrete, uh, some crumbling tracks, and a locomotive. So we built a crane, we built a pit, we rebuilt a car mover so we could shove it back and forth, we rebuilt forklifts. We set up a machine shop, a tool shop, administrative areas, uh, everything we needed to do the work of restoring the locomotive, which was, um, which was hard and expensive all by itself. We thought doing the tender first would be not too expensive, it would be a good team building exercise that would allow us to get our techniques down for disassembling things, labeling all the parts and pieces so we could find them again, and then uh, rebuilding the tender. Uh, by 2008, we had done that. We put the tender back together, and it worked. At which point, some people started taking us serious uh, that maybe we could do this. Up to that point, we were a bunch of old fools with a $1 locomotive, and it was very difficult to raise funds when people didn't really think we could pull this off. When the tender was done, we started working on the locomotive. That's basically almost, almost 10 years ago and the first couple of years was disassembling everything, which found one disappointing uh, area of wear and tear, rusted metal after another. Uh, thousands of pieces had to come off, be photographed, uh, be documented, be stored in a retrievable fashion. And uh, the machine got to be a really disappointing rusted hulk after a couple of years of that. And then, after the boiler repairs were started, we were able to begin to put appliances back on the locomotive and slowly, bit by bit, system by system, we've been able to get the thing back together. Along the way, we've expended $2.6 million as of last December and 161,000 hours of volunteer labor. We haven't anybody who's a paid employee. Everybody here is doing it for love, not for money, and we depend on uh, donations from large and small sources. Our big donors are frequently $100 bills. Uh, people who buy a t-shirt can make a little money on that. Uh, or people who remember us at Christmas time and give us a little gift. Uh, the Latin phrase is ad de parvum parvum manus acerbus erat. Adding a little bit to a little bit, a great deal is accomplished. And that's what we've done. Uh, we're at the point now where by the end of the calendar year 2017, we'll have our first fire in the boiler to make steam to clean out all of the appliances and the valves and the passageways with uh, uh, the steam that's, that's from the boiler. That done, we'll put the pistons and the valves back in and mechanically be ready to run. We have to assemble the new electrical system which has been designed for the machine. Uh, we have to build uh, about 80% of the jacketing is yet to be finished. We've got a head start on that. 
uh, that and the new installation will go on the machine and it'll be ready for test runs. Gee, that could be a year from now, it could have moved under its own power multiple times. So it's getting to be the good part of the project. This is exciting. Yeah, now you, you've changed the you've changed the typeface. We had we had uh, some free stick-ons that were not the right font, but they made it look like it was finished. And these are hand painted with the original font. Yeah. By one of our guys, oh, the guy we named the lake after. Right. Ernie Robart, who's actually done most of the lettering on the cars in Chama. That's oh. kind of what he likes doing. Mike, do you know what the name of that font is? Railroad Roman. Really? There's a Railroad Roman? Oh, okay. That's what they call it. And the Santa Fe used it, uh, you know, it was, their, it was one of their signatures. And they put it on by hand. They weren't, they weren't stick on. They were literally hand done, so this is hand done. But this is the correct font, so the rivet counters can quit whining about that. Yeah. 24,500 gallon water capacity, about 7,000 gallons of oil. And it, when we started, it was the two, two of the four dirtiest places in Albuquerque. The, uh, the cistern for water, uh, all those rows of rivets correspond with baffles that crisscross the inside of the thing, keep it from springing out when you load it with water. Mm. Uh, and every surface was covered with uh, an enormous amount of calcium carbonate Right. Uh, in the local lingo, that's caliche, and it was in places as thick as your hand, and we were afraid that pieces the size of your hand would break off and fall into the water intakes. Mm -hmm. uh, Santa Fe had never cleaned it, so we did. We pulled three tons of that stuff out of there with hand tools, um, mm -hmm. basically with needle scalers and things, knocking it off the walls and scooping it up and passing it out in buckets. That, uh, that took about a year of Saturdays on my part. I've been in every corner of the inside of this thing repeatedly. The oil can up front is nested down inside, and it it is uh, the design was gen generically for a coal-fired machine. Mm -hmm. So the pocket in which the oil can sits is actually a coal pocket. You'd recognize it as a place that would that would go. So the can is shaped the same way. Shaped for coal. Uh, the, the, mm. the oil can mm -hmm. fits where the coal pocket is. Right edge to edge. It's the mm -hmm. stupidest looking can you ever invented. If you were going to make a 7,000 gallon oil tank, you'd probably come up with a rectangular solid. Well, not so here. And the oil that they used was what was called Bunker C. Now they call it fuel oil number six. Now, some had been left in the tank for 50 odd years. And with the heat that we have, that had become bunker asphalt. So we literally had to dissolve it with 55 gallon drums of kerosene and then go in in supplied air suits like a diver and muck the stuff out again. The supplied air suit went in white, came out completely black and you throw it away after one trip. But uh, we rehabilitated the tender before we ever started on the locomotive. At one time the body of the tender was off on cribbing. The trucks were set on a short scrap of track that we built and named for our safety officer. We had to rebuild the the, uh, the braking system uh, from the cylinders through all the linkages to the brake shoes. We got lucky. It turns out that they still make this particular radius of shoe, so you can just buy shoes for <coughs> oh, they're 25 bucks or something like that, uh, and they're perfect. They're a replacement for a cast iron brake shoe. But the, the these, these trucks are four axle trucks, aren't they? Yeah. So the they, they weigh about 35 tons each, just the truck, mm -hmm. which is not a trivial exercise in, in repairing and rebuilding. Because people think when uh, you start a big job like this, oh, we'll do the tender, that's the easy bit. That's, well, that, we thought that's, it would be easier than the locomotive, and we thought it would be easy. We had one of those correct. It was easier than the locomotive, but it wasn't easy. No. And uh, we had, fortunately, some benefactors who arranged to bring uh, big cranes down to do the work of lifting things off and, and separating them. And then in 2008, we had a, a, a pair of cranes from Crane Service donated that arrived at 6 in the morning. We did all the spotting, we did all the rigging, lifted the body of the tender up and put it down on the precisely placed trucks. 
and uh, the, the body of the tender was in the air for only 24 minutes. We caught it on the first try. These have great big round bolsters that you plug into, and you can't plug it into one and walk it into the other. You have to engage both right. of them simultaneously. I've got a quarter of an inch to work with. Right. And we managed that on the first try. I couldn't believe it. By noontime, the cranes were gone, and we were eating enchiladas and having a party. So it was a good day. Now this, we started on the locomotive. Now this is your, your, you're going to tell me about the brake system. Oh yeah, we just, just passed it. the plumbing for us, yeah. the 26 L, and I, I don't really understand all the, I know what they are, because they got J1 relays, and there's little reservoirs, and there's uh, air cleaners, because you, you really don't dare suck garbage through a, uh, an air brake system. We got smart, our chief mechanical officer decided to use these high pressure braided stainless steel lines instead of copper. Uh, you can't hard pipe but a few things. It just gets insane trying to get around the corners. And if you use copper, it'll work harden and then it'll crack. And so you're forever re-plumbing something that was plumbed with copper. So these things are flexible, really expensive. This one's like 300 bucks. Um, what pressure is running through this? Uh, these are running, depending on where we're at, between 90, 135, step down to 60. Mm -hmm. Different valves are working at different pressures, mm -hmm. but uh, it's, it's actually good for much higher pressures than that. But the blessing is it'll wiggle instead of breaking. And that, uh, that, that was pretty snazzy, but look at that mess. If you saw the wiring diagram for it, or a plumbing diagram, it, it looks like somebody was having a nightmare when they drew it up. And our guys have worked like little dogs yeah, to fantastic. establish this plan. Mm. None of that was there. It had a very simple number eight brake system, oh. only a few lines, only a few valves, oh. only a few hoses. Um, so, so thank God for Paul Baines because he understood it, and nobody else down here did. And the reason for changing to that brake system was um, we need to be compatible with modern mainline operations. And with this, we'll have the same brake system as the diesel behind us. Uh, so they, they mesh together beautifully. And the other thing is, these are expensive. The parts, absent, the, absent these expensive stainless steel flexible lines, just the valves and the reservoirs and the relays uh, is about $17,000. And you need a complete set of spares, because if anything goes wrong, mm -hmm. you put in a new one right then. You don't, you don't try to fix mm -hmm. it. You, you uh, put in one that's already certified. So we have a complete duplicate set of parts and pieces for one of these things, and uh, they're available. They're not cheap, but they're available. <laughs> Number eight, you can't get the pieces. <laughs> and if you can get them, I've heard that 844 uses a number eight. I don't know. Uh, mm -hmm. But I don't know how they, how they, of course, they do a lot of stuff in-house, so maybe they have the ability. We certainly didn't have the ability to get a, a set of certified number eight parts. So yeah, it's, it's a, a modernization thing which will allow us to freely enter, um, you know, MU with other diesel locomotives. Yeah. There's the shoe where the ATS goes. We have that. That was only ten thousand dollars. This, this fellow here. Yeah, uh, yeah, available from Siemens for for ten thousand dollars. We have a we have a complete ATS shoe. Uh, the, we have to have that north of Albuquerque because that's what the rail runner uses. Uh, now the rail runner is fussing around. They're going to have to upgrade to uh, positive train control PTC stuff. So that'll be another expensive job. It could be a hundred thousand bucks. The problem with the steam locomotive for PTC, as I understand it, and I'm not an engineer or a mechanical engineer or any of those things, but it's easy enough to set the brakes automatically, that part of it. How do you throttle back a steam locomotive with an electrical signal from a computer in Dallas? Near as I can tell, what we'll wind up doing is we'll have to cut the fuel flow with a with a, an electromechanical link right. that a computer can say, stop the fire. That still leaves 7,000 gallons of, of water at 400 degrees and 300 PSI inside the boiler, but it won't make any more. So between setting the brakes by remote control from out of town and chopping the fire, 
maybe that's the solution for PTC, but PTC and steam locomotives weren't designed mm -hmm. for each other. No. One, one of the things that I really love about these engines is these massive roller bearing yeah. systems here. The, the roller bearings are uh, from 1946. It didn't come with them. And in fact, it was kind of an interesting thing. The Timken Company sold the railroad, in this case, the Santa Fe Railroad, 30 kits to put on lightweight side rods, though there's really not much lightweight about these rods when you go to move them around, and tapered roller bearings. The tapered roller bearing under here weighs about 350 pounds. The rods, I have no idea what they weigh, except it takes a forklift and six guys to move them around. The original heavyweight rods, you can always tell from profile because they come off here and just keep going all the way down to here. These neck down, they've got this scallop. They really are lightweight. So these are the, uh, what you'd call these lightweight are, rods. They, these these aren't the originals. No, 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 no. The originals were big, massive chunks yeah. of steel. Yeah. But the originals were, in the time of World War II, the expensive uh, alloys were going into armor plate for tanks yeah. and uh, you know, uh, battleships and mm. things like that. The Santa Fe Railroad and all the railroads were told if you want to build a steam locomotive, it has to be built out of mild steel. So to get the same pressures that they wanted, they had to build them with much thicker steel in the boiler, and that meant they got heavier, which meant they got better traction. They'd still go fast. Uh, and it also meant that uh, it's easier to repair them. It's, it's easier for the welding and so forth. The, the metals don't get brittle on you. Um, and so it was a blessing that they used mild steel. But the side rods, because of the asymmetric push, the, the line of thrust is not on the wheel center where you optimally like to have it, uh, are going to make this thing try to wobble as it goes faster and faster. They can beat that in, in part with counterweights. These counterweights are steel cans that were filled with lead shot. And if you look, you'll see marks on them and scars. When the lightweight side rods went on, they had to calculate how much lead to remove, cut the cans uh, open, yeah. pull out lead, weld the lid back on. We re-welded all the lids because our welders are very fussy and they didn't like the way the Santa Fe did it. But these were largely emptied of the lead and then it was about the right weight just as a steel can. The Timken company rebuilt our bearings for us. We, we had to, oh, when Timken sold you bearings, they sold you equipment to install the bearings and they sold you equipment to uh, pull the bearings back off again. None of that equipment exists anymore. So our machinists and mechanical engineers and welders had to build nine separate bearing pullers just to get the things off. We divided them like archaeologic specimens by segment in specially built crates that were the size of a foot locker and made eight separate crates and found the drawings for these in a museum in Texas got the drawings copied and sent each crate to Timken in South Carolina where they have a rebuild factory. And the bearings were older than anybody in the factory. And they did it as a, an interest project, uh, did a miraculous job, and then sent two of their engineers back with the bearings to make sure we put them on correctly. They didn't want to see their work messed up by a bunch of rookies. Well, we had to build nine separate bearing pushers to get them back on their interference fits. Uh, so you pack everything with uh, dry ice and get it as cold as you can and then use 20 ton hydraulic rams to suck them into place. Uh, it was quite a project getting them on and getting them on correctly. After the bearings are on, then putting the rods on was a little bit of a problem because the, the rods have been off for more than a year. And no matter how careful you are, you're going to get them out of time. So that these rods have to be captured on both ends at the same time. You can't put it on one and swing it onto the other. So if these wheels, where those crank pins, are a little out of time where one pin's farther around than the other, you, you can't get the rods on. We had a PhD, he was down here calculating how to jack up an axle against those springs, grease up the, uh, the rails, and use come-alongs to turn the wheels until they were the right distance so that we could get the side rods on. And there's this 85-year-old guy in here, it's about eight, nine years ago, who had actually run this machine as a young man. And we were explaining the problem to him, he started laughing. I said, Glenn, what is so funny? He said, I just use wedges. We all kind of looked at him and said, 
wedges. He said, sure, you know, a piece of metal, about that long. Nothing here, about two inches there. I get it. You make the wedges like that, you place them on the rail, and then you pull the locomotive up. The wheel climbing the wedge will turn a slightly different distance than the one in front or the one behind. Mm -hmm. When the two crank pins are in the right place, you put on the side rod. So, you know, old and sneaky beats young and but smart that, every day. But that's so easy when you think about it, I guess. It's a trick that we didn't mm. know. Uh, I, this guy didn't fix them, he just drove them. Mm. But he knew the trick. Uh, you know, I, I, I assume that in 1940, anybody who worked on the railroad with steam, they, they knew the trick. Oh yeah, they're getting the rods back on, they'll, they'll use the wedges to get the wheels <laughs> in the right posture relative <laughs> to each other. So how many of those tricks have been lost? There were more than 5,000 jobs at the back shops in Albuquerque at one time. Mm -hmm. It was the economic driver for Albuquerque. Yeah. And how many really clever things were known by just anybody? The apprentice could tell you. The secretary might even know. Clearly the guy who was doing the work had done it a hundred times. And none of that knowledge is around anymore. Yeah. We're reinventing and, and finding things out the hard way that everybody just knew. Well, I guess almost all of it was not documented. Why bother? Everybody knows. Mm. You know, my dad knew. You know, when I went to work, they, the, the guy who was running the crew said, listen, kid, you do it like this. Um, why would you write something like mm. that down? Mm. Wow. You had to have erection drawings to build one. Yeah. Um, but fixing them? So we're, we're, we're gradually finding out things that must have been totally obvious to everybody in the shops, yeah. you know, before I was born. Pretty cool piece of equipment, you got to admit. Oh. Our, our uh, crossheads are Babbitt lined, and if, if you dare get greasy enough, there are multiple shelves that, upon this it's not a simple bearing, it's, mm -hmm. it's multiple fingers that slide back and forth. You might be able to actually get a, a clue. Mm -hmm. You get your hands dirty, we've got something more. One of them had been machined three times and the other had been machined twice. We said, no, we want to go back to virgin Babbitt material. So I didn't know anything about Babbitt and I looked it up and there's 10 different kinds of Babbitt. The one we needed only cost $20 an ounce and we needed 501 ounces. So $10,000 out the door, just poof. Uh, but the Grand Canyon Railroad did the work, and they have this Prussian machinist who is like Mr. Perfection. And he did a marvelous job. He's got a big horizontal milling machine and was able to uh, make them perfect. Mm -hmm. So those are factory specification crossheads. Um, I'll be an old fool in a nursing home drooling down my chin before there's ever a problem with those things. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be somebody else's problem. <laughs> uh, and at one time, this this locomotive actually pulled uh, passenger trains to the canyon rim. Mm -hmm. We've got one picture of it with another 2900 up at the El Tovar Hotel. And so we really, really, really would like to go back. Yeah. They would love to have us. Mm -hmm. uh, if we could get there one of these days, uh, we'd campaign for a month or something like that, running four or five times a week back and forth to the canyon rim. Mm. They'd sell more tickets, mm. we'd get more running time, everybody would be happy. Mm. Uh, you would probably be there taking pictures, yeah. taking video. Definitely. You know how that works. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the problem is between us and Williams, Arizona, it's is quite a long the, way. The Transcon. Mm. But it isn't the distance. This thing ran from Kansas City to San Diego, mm. and all they stopped for was passengers mm. and uh, and water and fuel. They didn't even oil around because it's got a distributed lubricating system. Right. Uh, you put five gallons of lube in each of three reservoirs and you don't have to oil around. Uh, the guys at 3751 have been in the custom of inviting small crews from our group to go work with them when they run. And they're basically used as oiling slaves. Uh, they stop every 100, 125, 150 miles and oil everything by hand. Mm -hmm. This machine oils itself as it goes. Mm -hmm. Of course, we have an enormous investment in rebuilding that system. Right. Did you know the only place in the world you can get the copper line that that system uses is in London? Mm. And they sell it in 4,000 millimeter sticks, 13 feet. So basically, you have to cut it in half before they ship it because if it goes in a regular shipping container, it doesn't cost as much. And you were going to cut
cut it anyway. Mm. But yeah, there's only one place to get the copper and we had to put in new copper. It's very heavy wall. Right. It has a little tiny hole down the middle of it, a great big thick wall because right. it's under pressure. I, I think I saw the uh, the oil you may, you put, system. Yeah, yeah. There's two pumps on the engineer side and there's one pump on the uh, fireman side. Steam heated to keep the lube nice and juicy because without the steam heat, it's basically worse than syrup. And the the copper lines are are insulated. Uh, the original insulation, of course, was asbestos, which we had to get rid of. Uh, that was an expensive little proposition getting rid of the asbestos. This is a braided ceramic, um, really expensive stuff, but it works great. And you can follow the lines. They go all over the locomotive, and they find little distribution boxes that further break it down to 13 13 of these boxes the lube comes in here and there's a mechanical gizmo that that as the lube comes in is hydraulically pushed around in four corners so it very slowly divides the incoming into four outgoing spurts mm that then travel off to a journal or wherever it needs oil. So there are, count them up, four times 13 places that get oiled all by themselves. And this, the 3751 guys are jealous. I'd love to have that, eh? Yeah. Well, the worst problem they have apparently is that particularly on the desert runs, the refrigerator in their tool car is packed full of lubrication sticks. Mm -hmm. Because it has to be kept cold or it'll just run all over the place. So they can't keep soft drinks and other adult beverages inside the refrigerator. They, it's packed full of, uh, of uh, cold lubrication sticks. Is it, it, from here. You can see a couple of those lube lines come down to a journal here. Right. Which I've decided is why they put holes in the wheels. So you can mess with those things. Except you have to work the locomotive back and forth until the wheel matches mm -hmm. the fitting. And then, of course, if it matches this one, it doesn't match anything else. Yeah. So we've done a lot of shifting back and forth as we've fiddled with re-plumbing all of this stuff. Is, is this the best side? You were showing us the stay bolts on the other side. Is this the best side to see the, the work on the stay bolts, or should we do that um, in, on the, the other, other side? side uh, I don't think we can see through the footboard very effectively here. You might know, see one below the footboard. There's a little square patch here. You could get that all in one field of view. Oh, yeah. But that's a patch. Uh, behind the footboard is another patch. Over here, again below the footboard, is a third patch. These are little ones. The one on the other side is, uh, you know, many feet wide in every mm -hmm. direction. It's it's bigger than my it's bigger than my uh, dining table. And uh, that was a that was a slog. We spent a long time with some spectacular welders. We had excellent support from the local 412 Plumbers and Pipefitters Union. Um, Two guys who could weld anything have devoted an enormous amount of time just because they love us doing some of this pressure welding. We got lots of people who can weld, but not on a pressure vessel. Mm -hmm. And the, those certifications are part of the records that support the Form 4, which is what the FRA calls a, a boiler card. Right. I mean, if you go to a, an industrial power plant or the university, there's a boiler card which calculates what that vessel can be be worked at. Um, different different words, same problem. And because of the fact that a boiler here that blows up kills the three of us before we knew it happened, they're serious about those boiler cards. The Form 4 is uh, um, probably one of the most elaborate calculations that any of us have ever had to make. And fortunately, mm -hmm. we've got a guy who has a PhD in materials science who formerly worked as a vice president at the Sandia Laboratories, and that's his problem. And if there was ever a guy made for the job, that's it. it was our boy Frank. So he's 
he's labored with that. It's 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 ready for signature now. Thank God. Now the the as presuming the lagging on the boiler was asbestos. It was. And so it what what be. what material do you use? We'll will you use, lose? We'll use a a ceramic called kale wool, which uh, the plumbers and pipe fitters and welders love. It is almost as good as asbestos from a thermal point of view, mm. but it's not asbestos. And uh, we spent... Does it come in sheets or do you, um, how do you bend it? Or? Rolls, uh, oh. uh, rolls of, of blankets actually. Oh, it's flexible two foot then. Wide, two foot wide blankets. Mm -hmm. And then we have a slightly different material for the area of the boiler straight on top where you might need to walk. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a, uh, uh, we have a heavier uh, version that comes in, in slabs that'll stand being stood on. Uh, but th that's one of the next big problems is we're fabricating a whole new jacket for it. The original one was rusted to pieces. That's the, the outer metal jacket. Right, yeah. and that's yeah. and the only thing the jacket does for you is keep the insulation from flying off. Yeah. It's not for streamlining. It's just Purely to keep practical, all that yeah. expensive uh, insulation on. Mm -hmm. And asbestos worked extremely well and did you keep all the, all the old jacket sheets for, as as, oh, yeah, as templates as well as as much as could be many of them were in such shreds that it was hard to make templates out of them mm -hmm. we kept every one of them we mapped every one of them we've got documentation and photographs and they're all numbered and lettered and but they're mm -hmm. such junk that you're almost starting from yeah. scratch and sheet metal work turns out to be a real pain in the butt mm -hmm. it's heavy it's hard you take your perfectly designed and cut piece and you drag it up on top of the locomotive and go, damn, it doesn't fit. So you make little marks on it, and you drag it all the way back down, and you snip out the piece you think didn't fit. Mm -hmm. And you drag it all the way back up, and it doesn't fit. And so you mark it again, and you drag it down. And after about five trips, it finally fits. Right. There's 50 pieces left to go. Keep keep working. And these these driving wheels are 80 inch. 80 inch drivers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And each of them are pretty heavy. I have no idea how heavy those are. Did you have to take them away to have them turned, the tires turned, no. or? No, we've got a we've got a spur profile. This by pure dumb luck, the Santa Fe left these with a with a a, a grade A profile on them, a couple hundred thousand miles before anything has to be done to them, if then. So, got lucky on that one. So these are the tires as. As we found it, and they're not the originals. They are obviously put on somewhere along its life. Yeah. Uh, it only ran about a million miles. It started running in 44, and they uh, they uh, put it up in December of 1953. So somewhere they put new tires on it. Somewhere. In this cylinders all have you had to rebore the cylinders or anything? We, we honed them uh, you can't get a 28 inch diameter home we built one mm -hmm. uh, a hydraulically driven home and before we put the rods back on because we had this absolutely perfect crosshead courtesy of the Grand Canyon Railroad we actually built a hone that would hang on the crosshead so it was already trammed so that it was perfectly centered on the cylinder mm -hmm. and then our guys actually built a hone and from that point, it was simply, uh, once the thing's spinning, you have a guy at the front end squirting oil all over everything and another guy marching it back and forth by hand to polish the cylinders. So mm -hmm. that's that was how we had to do that job. Um, it's been amazing how many little problems you have to solve for yourself in this line of work. You so, so you haven't had to um, return the, the cylinders or the pistons then? No. They're fine. Right. The brass rings for the pistons are in great okay. shape. Ooh. And the cylinders basically just needed polishing. Probably would have been just fine the way they were, but we have some perfectionists here mm -hmm. that weren't going to settle for anything mm -hmm. less than the best they could arrange. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's. And to rebuild those, too. Um, it turns out you can get a 14 inch home, and our air pumps basically, we had to take them completely apart you notice there's new copper gaskets in them. Mm -hmm. um, all of that has been honed. The pistons, to get them trued, uh, we found a place in Phoenix, Arizona that does aircraft landing gear and shipped them the, uh, the, the shafts and they, they trued them. And so they're, 
cooking. But yeah, do it yourself. So you're, there's two sets of air compressors. Yeah, one, yeah. one behind each pump shield. Yeah. We actually are going to take the pump shields off so we can do some more work on them. We just had them on for the open house because mm -hmm. they make it look a little mm -hmm. more finished. But yeah, the, uh, the work continues. This something that they didn't plan on. This is an equalizing airline that our guys have been uh, fabricating and finally got on and tested uh, so that we can we can run behind another locomotive and put our air reservoirs uh, to theirs. Mm -hmm. so if you're, if you're going to run multiple units together, it's smart to have the uh, brake pressure uh, shared between the reservoirs of both locomotives, so you have right. to have an equalizing line to connect those reservoirs. And they never planned on doing that mm -hmm. when they ran this, so it was easy to rig one out the, the rear of the tender, but we had to find a place. This, this pipe had to be snuck through a bunch of places to get here so that we'll have another hose. So again, that was never a feature on the original no. engine, no. no. They didn't bother. But we weren't concerned with that. Yeah. And look, it went rain and it got it all messed up again. Yeah. And the border itself, you can see the size of the smoke box door. It's, it's huge, isn't it? Yeah, you could have a meeting in there. Mm. Yeah, play cards. Mm. The, uh, you saw how big the firebox was. And there is a, a story that might be true, another good story, that Baldwin was so proud of their massive firebox as they held a meeting of their board of directors in a firebox mm -hmm. just to kind of thumb the mm -hmm. nose of mm -hmm. the competition. Mm -hmm. but yeah. Lovely story. Nothing, <laughs> nothing small about this thing. Nothing lightweight. And the, the uh, putting the plumbing back on the running board. How well does this photograph for you from in here? That line. gaping hole mm -hmm. in the side sheet. Yeah. Put that off and all the stay bolts thre uh, threaded out. Right. And then we, we chamfered both ends on the inside and the outside and those are uh, full penetration welds rather than threaded. So like these are all, these were threaded. Mm -hmm. And of course the, the flexibles are threaded too. If you look at these <coughs> sleeves. So, so those are the those are the flexibles though. Right, and there's quite a few of them out there. Oh yeah, I can see, yeah. They come in two sizes, big and bigger. Yeah. And if you, if you get a closer look, you realize they're not all quite the same. If you see this one, it's got a, it's got a waist here I can stick my fingers into. Mm -hmm. That's an original. Mm -hmm. We had more than a thousand of these that were so badly rusted that what we had to do was, was shave them off with, with grinders and replace them with a larger sleeve, which was welded. And so you'll see this is cylindrical all the way down. It doesn't have a place where I can hook my finger like this one does. Mm -hmm. So all of these that are cylinders are replacements or repairs. And each one took a guy who was qualified to do that kind of welding about an hour to do. So the hardware cost about 75 bucks and the value of the labor was another 75 bucks, multiplied by slightly more than a thousand. And nothing cheap. Um, once again, if they left it in a building, mm -hmm. none of that would have been necessary. Mm -hmm. As it was, asbestos works like a sponge to hold water against steel. Uh -huh. If it's not, if it's not screaming hot, if you haven't fired it, that water just sits there. If it's screaming hot, the water doesn't stay; it doesn't rust. But the asbestos around these things had caused so many of them to rust so badly, we literally had to grind them off. Now that I can do. I'm pretty good with a grinder, but I can't do the weld. And, and if I could, I'd never get certified. So um, we had a combination of three different things. We had a grant uh, from BNSF for $10,000. We added $7,000 and purchased um, the welds on about a third of them. All we did was we pay, the company made us a deal. They, we just paid the wages for the guys doing the welding. Uh, a third of them our own welders did and then another company completely on their own hook uh, at no expense to us did the welding on the, the last third of them. So we had, at any given time, there might have been three or four welders hanging on the machine somewhere 
out of each other's reach welding. But um, it was still expensive. It was still really expensive. And God bless the guys that, who do the welding because that's, that's not easy work. I mean, it, that's hard work. Yeah. We're gradually getting things assembled in the cab. The uh, 26L brake stand it did not come with and had an old number eight, which you can't even get pieces and parts for anymore, much less getting them certified. So fortunately, we have a guy named Paul Baines who worked his whole life for the BNSF doing brake systems. So he has fabricated a remarkably complicated system and he's setting it up for uh, MU multiple unit stuff so that our engineer will actually be able to control the diesel behind yeah. us. Mm -hmm. um, which we have friends at 3751 and they say basically when they're on the road, their engineer and the guy in, in the diesel are yelling at each other on the radio all the way up and down the line. Mm -hmm. You know, give me another notch, give me five pounds, and uh, this guy will just be able to run both machines by himself. So we think that's clever. I mean, in for a dollar, in for a dime. Uh, you, you've got uh, a lot of things that are nice so a lot of these gauges are, are new gauges now oh, yeah. aren't they? this thing was completely stripped when it was sitting in the yeah room. yeah every time we have a kid that uh, well an adult who says oh when I was a kid I used to play on that locomotive in the park my standard question is really do you know anything about the gauges that went missing <laughs> and they always I didn't take them but yes everything you see up there is new and what you're looking at now uh, i'm sorry the light's not a lot yeah. better than that okay. those are unbreakable sight glasses yeah the originals were just glass cylinders in a wire cage so that when they when they fractured uh, pieces of glass wouldn't hit you because they'd stop at the cage of course then you had to scramble to shut off the feed to the to the gauge while it was blowing hot steam at you those won't break so no, they're not the original prototypical pieces, mm -hmm. but they're a lot safer. Yeah. And you have, I see different marks for different grades in that sort of I, thing. I think you can see it up yeah, there. Yeah, uh, I can. The green line for a, yeah. for something on the flat. Yeah. And then there's up and down. Yeah. Red lines above and below that. And there's your boiler plate. We do. That's brand new. Right. Steam test, 310 pounds. Water test, 363 pounds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Uh, now we're all fired, I so. Don't, I don't, yeah, we're oil fired. Um, actually, the, the joy of this is we just just got the brick laid in here. I don't know how well you can see it, but that is a gorgeous brick job. Yeah, I can we see We have two gentlemen from the uh, Bricklayers Union that came in and did this, and it was a joy to work with them. Yeah. Talk about professionals. Watching them cut brick. Imagine, if you will, two guys. Speed limits around here won't, won't let us, uh, in some places we might be able to do 90. Yeah. I can't believe a machine like this doing 90 miles an hour. I mean, just the way things fly around, when you look at the motion of the valve, uh, the Walshertz gear, um, at 90 miles an hour that has to cycle six times.